Good evening. Good evening and welcome to our animal program. It is so nice to see all these boys and girls and you brought your parents and grandparents. That was awesome. Well, on behalf of Loma Linda University Church, I just want to extend a very warm welcome for coming here tonight. Now, is there anybody who this is their first time coming to our animal program? Raise your hand. Oh, we have some new people coming to visit. I am happy you are here. We have lots of creepy crawlies today, and we're going to have a lot of fun. But before we start, we need to invite Jesus to join us. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what an exciting time to come here tonight and to explore your nature. Lord, you've created some amazing animals for us, and we get to enjoy them tonight. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to enjoy your nature. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Bill Hayes. Bill Hayes works at the Biological Science Department at Loma Linda University. And Bill may have a little animal for us to enjoy. So, Bill. Oh, Bill. What do you have here? This happens to be a veiled chameleon, a very beautiful creature. And if you look close at the eyes, I'm going to have to get the camera for you. The eyes move independently. It has stereoscopic vision. And see how he kind of <laughs> wiggles his body as he moves? Is he going to turn brown because he's on your jacket? He changes colors. So he, I don't know, a lot of it depends on his mood. And okay. he's got a prehensile tail, so you can see how he can hang just, just like that. He's such a beautiful color like that. Oh, he's definitely lighter now. Yeah, beautiful creature. And they have a tongue they use to catch insects and bugs, and it just shoots way out there, uh, close to the length of its body. They're amazing little creatures. Awesome. Well, Bill... What other animals do we have this evening? We have a lot of amazing animals. You guys are going to love it tonight. Some of them are little, like this one. Some of them are huge, and we need to be quiet so we don't scare our animals. Okay? So try to keep the noise down. And I think we're ready for another pet to come out. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. All right. We have a special guest this evening, Carl. Miller from yes. Reptiles for Film. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. And Carl has some amazing animals to show for us tonight. Most of these belong to him. And Carl, what can you tell us about this beautiful creature? Well, this is one of the largest species of snakes in the United States, and it's kind of our iconic symbol for conservation. This is an eastern indigo snake from Florida. One okay. of their unique things about them is besides being one of the largest snakes in North America, one of their favorite foods are actually rattlesnakes. Hold still for the camera. Uh -huh. Oh, sure. Yeah, they have a natural resistance to their venom, so they can make a good meal out of a rattlesnake without being a victim them themselves. Okay, so uh, there's a species in Texas, there's a species in mm -hmm. Florida. Yep. And um, a few in South and Central America. Yeah. Now, how do these kill? Well, these ones, a lot of snakes either use venom or constriction. These ones, the jaws are so powerful that when they come across a prey, they simply grab onto them, and as they bite, it starts to break down the bones of the victim. That's how strong their jaw is. So it's a very tough bite. Yeah, and uh, they eat other snakes you mentioned. What yes. else? They, they eat pretty much anything they can find. They'll eat snakes, baby birds, rodents. They'll even eat small tortoises. Now, they have a special relationship with the tortoises in Florida, don't they? They do. One of the unique things in nature is how animals can coexist. Now, when these kind of den up for the winter, these will actually live in burrows with other animals such as tortoises. So they all kind of go to sleep together, wake up later in the year, and do their own thing again. All right. 
Thank you very much. Beautiful animal. Wait till you see the next one. <laughs> All right. Uh. <laughs> now that is, that is a handful. All How's right. your microphone there? Yes, yes. We're still, we're still wired. Okay. Yeah. Try to hold still for that camera there. Sure. Look at the beautiful tongue on this animal. Yes. So this is our good friend, Mr. Munchie. Quiet, people. <laughs> Please be quiet. Mr. Munchie is an Asian water monitor lizard from Indonesia. It's in the same family as the Komodo dragon. This is just a slightly smaller cousin. And what do these guys eat? You know, water monitors in the wild are complete opportunistic feeders. They will swim along the streams and jump up on farms, and if they find chickens, chicken eggs, but they'll also eat fish, crabs, pretty much anything they can get. And unfortunately, in some of the areas, they'll even find some old Burger King, and they're quite happy to eat that, too. Now, are all lizards meat eaters? No. Um, Mr. Munch is a pure carnivore. He just eats something that's going to be running from him for the most part. But we have other lizards, like green iguanas, that are mostly herbivores, and then some that eat a mixture of <laughs> plants and vegetations, but also protein sources like other animals and bugs. Will the, kids be able, will the kids be able to pet this animal? Oh, once we go outside, Mr. Munchie will be waiting for you. He'll have his little leash on, and you can come up, pet him, scratch him, give him a pat, and take some nice photos with him. But we want you to remember, when you touch animals, you have to clean your hands afterwards. There will be Absolutely. a lot of hand cleaner out there. That's very important. Great. That is a spectacular animal, <laughs> really he's, spectacular. He's a handful. Next time, we want you to bring a Komodo dragon, though. Yes, yeah, so I'll have to work out a little bit. OK. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Water monitor. Let's see if she can take that back. <laughs> wow. Good job. What do you think of that? <laughs> Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Right. Look at this beautiful little creature. That yeah. one's tiny. Yes. Look at the back on it. Turn the back so they can see that. Isn't that amazing? Yes. So this is one of nature's scariest predators, this little tiny tank. This is an alligator snapping turtle from the southeast. It is completely camouflaged. In fact, they're so sedentary in the water that algae sometimes grows on them and helps with their camouflage. And if you can see them lying on the bottom, they just look like a rock. OK. okay. And uh, is this a young one? This one Adult is a one? baby. This one is only about nine months old. They're a little bit smaller. They do hatch out of eggs. The uh, mother will have about 30 eggs that they'll drop. And uh, they may want to see mom. What do you you think? want to see mom? You want to see the mommy? All right. Let's do that. <laughs> hey, you can set it right there. <clears throat> I got it. We're good. <laughs> Thanks. How do you like that mouth? All right. This is Cranky Susie. Cranky Susie is probably about 35 years old. And she's cranky. Um, a couple of interesting things. We've talked about the camouflage and what great predators they are. Now, these animals live to be well over 60, 70, 80 years old and can be about four times as big as this. She's still got a long way to go, and uh, she'll be having a lot of babies through that time. Now, a fascinating thing about these, besides the natural camouflage they have, is when you look... <sighs> When you look inside the mouth, Quiet. you Quiet. see something pink. See that little pink thing? It looks like a worm. That is a separate appendage on its tongue called a caudal lure. And what they do is they sit at the bottom like this with their mouth open. They move that little piece on their tongue like a worm. And a fish that maybe isn't as smart will swim right up to her. And she'll just grab it because they think they're going to get that worm. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, so an alligator snapping turtle, what's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Well, a couple of things with the turtles and the tortoises, and there are some turtles that are kind of in between. So for the most part, turtles 
as in water turtles, have a streamlined shell meant to swim, okay? It's not as bulky. They generally have webbed feet, and they're adapted for a life to live underwater. Now, the tortoises that you see, they have more solid legs, almost like an elephant, to support the weight of their big shell. Good, good call to move away. Um, yeah, so that's some of the differences between them. Should we, should we see how it snaps? Yes, absolutely. All right, let's get that in the camera there. There you go. How's that? Yeah. Can you get that? Want to get it closer? Here. Oh, let's do one more for good measure. Uh -huh. Don't get my finger there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yes. All right. That would not be good for my finger. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Okay, we have Frankie another Susan. couple lovely creatures coming out. All right. Oh, All here's right. a beautiful little tortoise, one that lives yes. on land. So to cover our group of turtles and tortoises, the group Shellions, this is an African spur-thighed tortoise. This is a little baby that is only about eight months old. They do grow quickly because when they hatch out of their eggs, they're about that small, quite a bit smaller. But they eat a lot and they grow quickly. So this is what you might start with and then after a few years, you might get a little surprise. Oh, looks like we have a big surprise. <laughs> there you go. Now, how is that? Yes. Now, when, if you make the mistake of buying this cute tortoise at your pet store and don't know what you're in for, one day you're going to have this digging up your house foundation. Yeah. This is JJ. And JJ is one of our many rescue tortoises because, shockingly, someone couldn't keep him when he got this big. He's a really sweet boy, but they're very powerful animals. At this size, we can only guess how old JJ is, but we'll say probably about 60 years old, knowing that they can live to be well over 80, possibly over 100 years old. And one thing about reptiles is, though they do slow down at a particular adult size, reptiles never stop growing. They're always growing throughout their whole life, just the growth rate slows down a lot. So this one, it'll probably take about a good 30 years before it gets close to this size. But they are very heavy, very strong, and they can be a little destructive. Okay, can you tell us yeah. again what, what it is and where it lives? Yes, this is an African spur thighed tortoise from Central Africa. And uh, it's about the third largest species of tortoise in the world. They actually get to be almost twice this size which is really big. JJ himself is about 100 pounds, but they can easily go to 150 or over 200 pounds. That's pretty big. Do you guys remember the big Galapagos tortoise we had a couple years ago? That was a really big yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. a lot. All right, thanks, guys. <clears throat> All right, now I have a couple special guests coming out. I'm glad I'm not carrying that. Yeah. <laughs> I have with me Eric, over here guys, Eric and Delaney Dugan. Now Eric was a former student in my lab. What did you, what did you study, Eric? I studied rattlesnakes at Chino Hill State Park. He did a fabulous job studying rattlesnakes. Did you put little... Put radio transmitters into 25 rattlesnakes and tracked them around for periods between one and five years. Uh, looked at their movements, looked at where they went how they competed with each other, uh, spent a lot of time with a lot of cool snakes. Okay, so uh, who'd you bring with you? I brought here, this is my daughter Delaney, and this is her gecko, this is a Lichianus gecko, uh, found on the islands of New Caledonia. Let's, let's make sure the camera can see that to your right, okay? Isn't that go. a pretty animal? It's, a, it's an arboreal species, which means that they live up in the trees, uh, they're found on, on, in New Caledonia's main island as well as a bunch of the smaller islands. This happens to be from Pine Island, and this is Delaney's gecko that just turned one year old uh, yesterday, Halloween. Now, is this a pet or a project or both? This is, a, this is Delaney's pet. She, uh, we're working on getting a breeding, breeding um as uh, she gets more, but uh, for now we're, we're working our way through this one. You're trying to breed them? Yep, absolutely, wow. absolutely. Wow. And they, they eat fruit and, uh, and some insects. Okay, so I brought them out here in part because I wanted to show pets. Kids love reptiles. You guys like reptiles? Look at all those, look at all those hands go up. Show your hands. 
Reptiles can make good pets. Sometimes they don't make good pets. I'm going to show you a PowerPoint if that comes on. I want to talk about this for a minute. I want to thank my parents, my mother's here, for letting me keep reptiles when I was young because they kept me out of trouble. Are these keeping you out of trouble? Yeah. Yeah, that was a yes. <laughs> if I could have the PowerPoint. And it doesn't seem to be working. Well, uh, what I wanted to do is uh, show you how... We'll just skip that for now, and we'll bring out some other pets. So I want to thank you guys thank very you. much. And uh, I have a few more pets coming out. I want to show you some pets that work well for kids and some that don't. So we have a king snake here from Arizona. Sonoran king snake, a beautiful creature. Nice thing about snakes, you feed it once a week and you give it water occasionally. You don't have to feed it every day. And it's in a small container and does well, okay? Wow. And then we have a different version of a king snake. This is a California king snake, albino. And we have a big, huge boa constrictor. You like that boa? That's a beautiful animal. Now, that's not such a good pet because they could <laughs> eat you into bankruptcy, okay? You got to feed them a lot. All snakes are carnivores. They all eat meat. None of them are vegetarians, okay? They wouldn't thrive in this church probably, but... And then we have a rosy boa, an albino rosy boa. What's nice about some of these snakes is uh, we have native rosy boas, but just buy the albinos or buy something that's been bred in captivity. Uh, we have a green iguana, a beautiful green iguana here. And these are from the tropics, although they've been released in big numbers down in Florida where they don't belong. But uh, these make lousy pets, kids. Don't ask for them, parents. Don't buy them an iguana, okay? They get aggressive, they get huge. People let them go. You should never let your pets go where they don't belong. We have a lovely uh, musarana. This is a snake from South America. They make excellent pets. Technically, it's venomous. Very tame, but venomous. Maybe not the best for your kids. Uh, and over here, we have a, heel, a beaded lizard from Mexico, uh, a lovely creature. It's venomous. Don't get your kids a venomous pet. And we have bearded dragons. They're wonderful. They take a little more effort to care for. You've got to have special lights for them. You've got to feed them a lot more often. Lizards have to be eaten a lot more often. Another bearded dragon, a lovely ball, py ball pythons make great pets. This is as big as they get, okay? And uh, then we have, what is this again? Baron's racer. Baron's racer, okay? This is from South America, a beautiful creature but it's technically venomous, okay? Don't get that, don't get that. And then we have a lovely corn snake. Corn snakes make fabulous pets. This one happens to be amelanistic, which means kind of albino. And uh, again, terrific pets, that's as big as they get. And then we have this veiled chameleon. A um, little difficult to take care of that, okay? All right, thank you guys very much. Hey, those are kind of fun, huh? Are we able to show that video or, or my PowerPoint? PowerPoints, here we go. I wanted to share a few things. Um, when surveys are done, there's been dozens and dozens, research articles that are published, they show that Christians and those of other faith groups are measurably less concerned about nature, about the environment, about the ecology and conservation than the public at large. I don't know why that is, it's troubling. I actually did a survey to, to explore this just a little bit. Uh, I had over 2,000 respondents. I asked them 10 questions that relate to conservation and ecology. And the results were interesting because those who keep plants and those who keep reptiles have a much greater interest in the natural world. And I was very impressed by that. And uh, even if I compared just experience keeping wild animals versus dogs, cats, or ke keeping wild animals currently, those individuals just had a greater interest in the natural world. I want to emphasize these reptiles as pets can be very good, but they have to be well cared for, okay? And you need to choose wisely, okay? Thank you. All right, let's bring out another animal. Oh, here's a beauty. I like that one. What do we have, Carl? Right here we have, this is a green tree python. They come from Australia and Indonesia. Talk loud. Yep. Oh, sorry. 
think the lizard moved my mic. So this is our green tree python from Australia and Indonesia. Um, a fascinating fact about these snakes, it's one of the few snakes that goes through a ch color change during its life cycle. When the young hatch out of their eggs, they're either a bright, bright yellow or a brick red. And as time goes on, after about a year or so, they gradually start turning green until they turn into what you see here. And one of the thoughts behind it is, when they're younger, they tend to stay lower in the jungle canopy where there are flowers and bright colors, so their bright colors as a baby would actually act as camouflage, but as they get older and they go higher up in the canopy, that's when the green really comes through. Okay, one, one quick thing. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, if you look at the, along the upper lip, mm -hmm. you'll see little, little holes. Those are called yes. labial pits, and those are used to see warm objects in total darkness. If it can hold still, well, maybe it won't yep. hold still long enough. There you go. See those little holes? Okay, now we've got another very impressive few okay. snakes to show you. Okay. Let's bring those out. All right. <clears throat> All right. All right, what's that? This right here, we have the largest species of snake in the world. Hey, that don't look so big. This cute little thing will turn into a 25-pound snake going over a couple of hundred pounds. This is a green anaconda from South America. Now, this particular snake is one month old, and this <laughs> is Archie, the dad, and Archie, as a male anaconda, tops out at about 12 to 13 feet, which he's about, because he's about 25 years old, <laughs> whereas the females get much bigger, knowing that they have to give birth to about 30 of these. <laughs> that is a big Here. snake, isn't well, it? Here, let's spread them out. That is a huge uh, snake. Spread them out a little bit. Okay, there you so go. Uh, where did you say Inside. these live? These are from South America. In the rainforest? Yeah, mostly in the uh, rainforest Amazon, but there are also some grassy highlands in Brazil where they live where they actually go through a dry season. And they'll actually bury themselves in the mud and kind of hibernate until the wet season comes around. Now, I bet those eat some big animals. They do. One of their favorite foods is a large rodent called a capybara, which gets to be well over 40 to 50 pounds. And these snakes, because they get so heavy, they have a largely aquatic life. When you look at the eyes and the nose compared to some of the pythons, they're more to the top, more like an alligator or crocodile. So this, this uh, 12 foot snake, or in the case of another one that's 20 feet, can hide their whole body in a few inches of water and just keep their eyes and nose visible as they hunt. And they do have the ability to use their tongue and smell underwater to find their prey. Okay, well that is an amazing <laughs> creature. Who would like to pet this later? Yes, you will be able to, absolutely. One quick question, yes or yes, no? Yes, sir. Can this squeeze a human and kill them? It absolutely has the strength okay. to kill a person. Okay, <laughs> but luckily, need... Archie is acclimated to humans, and he, he doesn't mind our attention at all. Okay, it is time now for our quiz. Thank you for bringing uh -huh. that impressive. What do you think of that animal? Okay, we've got three volunteers we've already selected. They're going to come up here, and it is time for a quiz, okay? The cold-blooded critters quiz. So we're gonna, uh, let me get my microphone here. So I need to know your names. What's your name? Estelle. That's a lovely name. Felicia. Ooh, very good. Alex. Okay, three wonderful young fans of reptiles, right? Do you guys keep reptiles? You don't need to, you don't need to. Okay, so let's have our first slide, the cold-blooded critters, and let me pull that up. We're going to start with this. What words best describe the temperature regulation of snakes and humans? Okay, they could be cold-blooded or warm-blooded. They could be ectothermic, endothermic, heterothermic, homeothermic. Woo, big words. Confused, intelligent. Uh, you want to take a guess as to which of those are? The snakes are cold-blooded? Why would you say cold-blooded? That, that might be the answer. A. You like A, and you? A, oh uh, no, uh, yeah, A. A, so snakes are cold-blooded, people are always warm. And then it's true that people are always warm, but that's not the best answer because many of these snakes 
can sit out in the sun and get warm, they can get warmer than you and me, okay? So that's not the best word. Ectothermic is a better word where they are the same temperature as the outside. They don't generate their own heat, except there are a couple of, exe of, of exceptions. There are pythons when they brood, their muscles contract and squeeze, okay? And they can generate heat and warm up their eggs. And then there's these tegu lizards where at night during the breeding season, they can warm up the burrows that they are in and they may lay eggs in those burrows. So you do have weird things, okay? Question number two. Most reptiles make lousy parents. I met a few in my time. Immediately, they immediately ban in their young, but which are exceptions? You want to guess which of those might be? We got snapping turtles, horn lizards, rattlesnakes, crocodiles, and Darth Vader. Who's a good parent? Any of them? There might be more than one answer. Um, I'm not sure. You're not sure, okay. E. You like B? Did you say B? Horned lizards? Oh, yeah. E. You like E? Darth Vader's a good parent, huh? D. You like D? Crocodiles. Well, here are the answers. Turns out horned lizards are very good parents. The female will actually lay her eggs and then sit in a bush right above them and chase away any snakes that want to eat her eggs, okay? And then the rattlesnakes, the mama gives birth, and for a week or so, she hangs by them, and she's more defensive and protects them until they shed their skins. And then they go their separate ways. And crocodile mothers are ferociously protective of their young, okay? Um, snapping turtles just abandon the eggs. Darth Vader, forget Darth Vader. Okay. Which of these factors increase the risk of getting a severe bite by a rattlesnake? Hmm, it could be more than one answer here. Playing hopscotch in the street, wearing shorts on a hike, being a boy or a man, poking and prodding snake, drinking too much alcohol. You know what? Rather than ask you, there are more than one. So let's just see the answers, okay? And it turns out it's the last four. Wearing shorts on a hike. There's research, my lab did, showing that if you have long clothing, it actually protects how much venom the snake can inject. Being a boy or man, 80% of the bites that are reported here at Loma Linda University Medical Center are to boys and men, because we're stupid. <laughs> Poking and prodding a snake, you can't do that, 45% of the bites, that's stupid. And drinking too much alcohol is dumb when you're playing with the snake. Okay, so snake bites are associated with the two most dangerous chemicals in the world, testosterone and alcohol, okay? All right. Which cold-blooded critter do you think is venomous here? How many of you say it's the gopher snake, Pastor Doug, or rattlesnake? What do you think? Gopher snake. The what? Gopher snake. All right, we have a gopher snake. Rattlesnake. Rattlesnake and say Pastor Doug. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the answer is going to be the rattlesnake. Uh, look at the tails. It's very important. Okay, we'll, we'll ignore Doug. But look at the tails. And see the skinny little tail on the gopher snake? Here in California, you're perfectly fine, but if it has that big blunt rattle, that's venomous. Steer clear. I have a video. We're not going to take the time to show the video. We're, we're a little behind. But what should you do if you see a snake, kids? Take two steps back, Jack. Can you all say that? Two steps back, Jack. One more time. Two steps back, Jack. Don't play with it. Go find an adult, tell an adult, okay? All right, so we treat these animals with respect, don't we? And I, I have a little gift for you guys. Um, it's not a reptile, but somewhere here. I have shark teeth. Close enough? You like sharks? You got a nod. Okay, there's a shark tooth. Those are big shark teeth. You got a shark tooth here and a lovely shark tooth here. And let's give our kids a hand here. Was that fun? All right. Now we got more animals. We got lots more animals. You won't believe what's next here, okay? I have, we have wonderful reptiles in Southern California. A lot of diversity. We're just going to show you real quick. Here is a lovely rosy boa. These are in rocky areas. Uh, this is a glossy snake. We see these out in the desert mostly at night. Um, these are most easily found at night. We have a desert tortoise, a lovely creature in our deserts that are in trouble. We're not taking good care of those animals. And we have over here a mountain king snake, a California mountain king snake. Beautiful creatures, red, black, and white. Don't you like that? Where are mountain king snakes found? 
mountains, okay? And then we have a striped racer, a very fast snake. This is, this is active in daytime, and they love to catch little lizards that run and run, and, and they'll eat other things. They'll eat rattlesnakes, okay? And then we have here a lyre snake. Now, technically, this lyre snake is venomous, but it's not going to hurt anybody. I don't know. It could hurt you, but no. It's pretty safe, and we are... We find those at night almost only. And then we have over here, where, where, I got there. So this is a red racer or Western coach whip, very fast snake that's active in daytime. Maybe you've seen that. And we have a California king snake. They can be uh, more black and white or brown and yellow and sometimes striped. A uh, very common snake that eats other species. This is a long nosed snake. We find these often out in the desert. And we have a gopher snake. They get quite big. They can actually mimic a rattlesnake by hissing. They coil like a rattlesnake does. They'll, they'll vibrate the tail, and um, that makes a little noise, whatever it bounces against. And then they'll hiss. That sounds like a rattle. Um, day and night active. And then, what? This is a European legless lizard. What are you doing with that? He told me to. Uh, somebody told you to, okay. That's not a local snake, okay? And, but, but you might have seen this before. How many of you saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, the original movie? Lots and lots of those, okay? And they have ears. That's how you tell the difference between a lizard and a legless lizard and a snake. They have external ears. All right, thank you guys very much. All right, we got more animals. And I'm getting hot. Okay, so what else do we have here? Um, Carl's coming back out with the cute little critter. Oh, I love these. Tell us what this is, Carl. Well, what we have here, this is little Chucky. He's a baby American alligator. He's actually about a year and a half old, but a perfect little replica of his big mama at home. Quiet, kids, please be quiet. <laughs> They do have a slow growth rate. Like I said, he's just about two years old right now, and they can easily live 60, 70, 80 years, maybe even longer. And for him to get six feet, it usually would take about 10 to 12 years or so. And some of the interesting thing is they do have their web feet in the back, that perfect tail for swimming and also to be used as a defense. Even at this size, if a small predator was trying to come for him, he can give him a good whack and then escape to the water. Do these, do these make good pets, Carl? They make terrible pets. Oh, we don't want these. They get too big. They're also kind of illegal. You do have to have very specialized permitting for them for obvious reasons. And they do get big. Were they once in trouble? Was the American alligator once... In, in, in an endangered species? Yes, absolutely. This is one of those animals that has been overhunted in the wild for its skin, for its meat, and also just because it has a reputation for being an ominous predator, when in reality, they just want to go the opposite way of we are. They don't want to hunt us at all. They just want to be left alone. Um, through wildlife management and restrictions, they've made a big comeback, though, and they're uh, now living in the areas that they should be. Okay, everybody needs to be quiet, kids. Be quiet. Carl's going to imitate. He's going to make this thing make a, a noise to call mommy. All right. Can you do that? So what the baby alligators do, because the parents will actually protect them after they hatch out. Not only will the mother guard the nest that they build on land, because all these animals want to eat her eggs, but even when the 30 to 40 babies hatch, they'll actually make a call for mama if there's any trouble. And it sounds like this. And that's how mama knows they need help. And the mother will actually carry them in her mouth to the water to safety if needed. Like I said, crocs can make good parents. Alligators yep. are crocodilians. There's about, what, 20 species? Yep, absolutely, all Little over the world. 20. Yes. All right, that's a fun animal. Do you have right. uh, anything related to that one to show tonight? Well, keeping with the theme of crocodilians, we do have something else. And let's hand off little Chucky carefully. Watch out. Okay. Whoa, we, we have All a right. crocodile. And we take our time with this. We have a crocodile. This is Nellie, 
our African Nile crocodile, one of the only Nile crocodiles in the state. She is about 12 years old, and again, reptiles never stop growing. The females do stay a little bit smaller than the males, where the males can go over 20 feet and nearly a ton in weight. The females stay a little bit smaller, but still have a nice, kind of a cranky attitude. And that's, you know, people ask, what are some of the differences between an alligator and a crocodile? There are physical differences, the shape of the snout, but really it's more about attitude. Um, alligators, I've told you, they will actually go the other way if you're in their waters. They don't want to hunt you, they don't want to eat you. Nile crocodiles in the wild are one of the few animals that actively hunt people. So <laughs> if you're swimming in their waters, you may be lunch. I don't think that one's big enough to eat us, but I bet it could rip an arm up. Yes, it definitely commands respect. Look at those teeth. Yeah. yeah. And if you can see... <laughs> That's a fast strike yes. right there. Absolutely. And we'll just swing around here. I might have to back up here. Now, what she did... There we go. Okay, let her settle. Now, this animal, this animal has been in late-night TV shows, uh -huh. okay? These are professionals yeah. who know what they're doing. Uh -huh. Now, what she showed you from the start is what a true ambush predator does. She can tread, no, yeah. Now, what they do is when they're, when they're not actively hunting in the water, they'll sit on the banks, and because they look like a log and they get so much warmth, other animals will actually land on them thinking it's a log, things like birds. And what they'll do is when someone gets too close, you think it's not gonna do anything, and before you know it, bam, and they've got their lunch. Now, another big thing about these crocodiles, besides their, their, their more aggressive attitude, I'll say, is some of the structure. You'll see they have teeth that points up in both directions, and you'll see a definite pointy snout compared to the alligators. Now on that close-up, what's amazing is, you see all those little freckles on that jaw? Those are actually sensory organs, which some fish have. They can actually detect magnetic movements in the water, so if there's prey swimming far away, they can tell that it's something that might be prey, and that actually leads them to it. That is a very impressive animal, I love it. Who gets to catch it? <laughs> Probably all of us, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I suspect so. Okay, um, are they gonna get to pet this one later? Absolutely not. <laughs> nobody's petting this one. Yes. I think you understand. Why. Nobody's that fast, yeah, nobody's that fast. But she'll definitely be on display out there. You'll see her in a nice big pen, um, so you'll be able to get some great up close photos of her too. All right, yeah. well, let's uh, see All if right. we can get her safely off the stage here. Now we'll let the fun begin. All right. Okay, what we do first is cover their eyes. When we cover their eyes, it calms them down. There you go. And Josh will restrain her. There you go. Now what we do is, <clears throat> our biggest concern is that the animal doesn't bump her head into something. We don't want her to get hurt. And then what we'll do is, of course, restrain the jaws just to keep them from hurting anyone else or themselves. And then normally when we travel them, we actually put the equivalent of a hood over their eyes, which keeps them calm, almost like with a falcon. And she's about seven feet and we're not looking forward to her being 10 feet. Oh, they Seven can feet's get a good. lot yeah. bigger than that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And this is, just like some of the tortoises we have, this is one of our many confiscations. This started as someone bought this little crocodile illegally as a pet, and then realized not only was it big, it was extremely dangerous. So that's one of the things we're able to do, is give them a nice, safe home. <laughs> Wow, mm -hmm. what do you guys think All of right. that? That's a good team there, that's a good team. That's a very impressive team. Thank you very much, Carl. And now we're gonna have Miguel come up for offering.
my job is to scare you enough so that you will give us money. So, whew. Seriously, we are so happy to partner with so many different institutions. La Melinda gets to partner with both, both the university, a medical center, the Southeastern California Conference, and we do so because we believe in two things. We believe in the education of children, and we also believe in the conservation and stewardship of the planet. And so that is one of the things that our children's ministries is about. If you are a visitor to this church, you are in luck because this church truly cares about the future of humanity, which is our kids. Therefore, we have all sorts of activities. We have clubs that teach them how to be better stewards, better citizens. We have a Sabbath school here every Saturday morning that teaches them how to walk closer to God. We have a myriad of activities that are designed to bring people together. And we can't do anything that we do without our most important partnership. And that partnership is with each and every one of you. 100% of the proceeds you give are, will be used to continue promoting programs that will make your children grow as people, as citizens, as Christians, and hopefully as animal lovers. So at this time, we would ask the deacons to take their positions, and we would close our eyes, and we are going to pray for the offering. Dear God, we thank you for the world you've gifted us. We thank you for the animals that you have put in this world. And we thank you for the relationships we are called to have with your creation. We ask that you give us the courage to be faithful stewards of it. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have lots more animals. I'm going to start, though, with uh, my colleague Steve Dunbar. He's going to come out here, and he's going to talk about some of his sea turtle research. So if we could have the PowerPoint. Dr. Steve Dunbar, he's in the Department of Earth and Biological Sciences where I am. Steve, you want to tell us Good about uh, some of the research that you do? Sure. Let's have the PowerPoint slide. So there are only three groups of marine reptiles. One is the marine iguanas, which you know about. Sure do. And the other is the marine snakes, sea snakes, that's a group. And then the other is the one that I study, and that's marine turtles, sea turtles. And they're all awesome. They are. So real quick, tell us, tell us where you do your work and the questions you seek to answer. Sure. Well, we are studying sea turtles in the country of Honduras and as well doing some work in Thailand now. And so we are interested in understanding where these turtles come from to live in the area that they live in what we can do to conserve and protect them because they are really important animals for the marine habitats. Can we show the video? We have a little video for the background. And uh, why should we be con concerned about these sea turtles? Okay, it's a great question. Well, one of the reasons is that these turtles are so important for the habitats that they live in. And we can see this one turtle here in the video that is actually working on eating some sponge, this particular species, which is a hawksbill. Its main food is a sponge, and you can see the sponge there that it's broken into. But one of the things that you recognize is that there are lots of fish hanging around that turtle. Those fish also want to eat the sponge, and that's a good thing because sponges can grow so quickly that they actually overrun the coral reef. They grow much faster than the reef. So these turtles help to keep the sponges under control. And these fish also like to eat sponge, but they can't break through the hard outer layer that's called the panaclocyte. And so they hang around and wait for the turtle to break through that hard layer, and then the fish come in and they get to eat some of the sponge as well. And we've seen some really cool behaviors in these fish and turtle interactions because sometimes the turtle will take off a big chunk of sponge and it'll drop down the reef and the turtle will go down looking for the reef and they're not the brightest animals in the water. So they kind of get lost when they're looking for this uh, little bit of sponge and the fish, these angel fish, will often guide them back up wow. 
to where the sponge is, Very show them the sponge so that they can keep eating. So we have been really enjoying the opportunity to work with these turtles and also not only working with the turtles in the water, but also at the nesting beaches. Yes. Because most of the time these turtles are staying in the water except during the nesting season when the females come out and lay their eggs on the beach. And then about 60 days later, the little turtles will hatch out of those eggs and then make their way down the beach to the sea again. Isn't this a beautiful creature? Unfortunately, sea turtles are being killed off and they're not doing very well and clearly we need them present to maintain healthy coral reefs, healthy ocean environments. Thank Absolutely. you very much for coming. You're welcome. Out. Thank you. Animals, you want to see more? Let's bring out another animal here. This one's, um, let's see, oh, this is a fun one here. Yeah. They're all fun. <laughs> what do we have, Carl? Well, this is a smaller cousin to Mr. Munchie, who you met earlier. This is a Philippine monitor lizard, um, extremely bright colors, but this, this animal comes from a land where they're still discovering new species. You know, we think we know it all, and all of a sudden someone's in the jungle, and it's like, we've never seen that before. And that's kind of the wonder of this animal kingdom we're working with, is we're always discovering new things. You know, this one, whereas Mr. Munchie, the water monitor, kind of lived along streams and waterways for the most part, this one is more inland forest. It's, it's actually still very good at climbing trees and hunting wherever it needs to. It can go climb up and get birds out of nests, they use that long forked tongue to grab molecules from the air and basically smell the air and find out where their prey is. I love those tongues. Mm -hmm. And uh, does this animal get much bigger? It does. This one, you know, again, starts really tiny as a baby. This one is a year and a half old, and it will still get to about five feet. So it'll be kind of like the size of a decent-sized toddler. So. Nice. That's yeah. a beautiful animal. Tell us again what it's called. A Philippine monitor lizard. Wow. Yeah. Lovely creature. Mm -hmm. I saw a picture of you with this animal on your head. I, I like that photo. Yes. And this is a thing. You know, these animals are acclimated to people. And they <laughs> love microphones. And Mr. Sherwin here will be outside to take photos with later on. He loves photos. destroying hair. All right. Very good now. As you walk back, do so carefully. Do we need a table? Um, it should be standing by, please. Do we need a table, guys? All right. And the mic is out? Yes. All right. Uh, we're going to use this. All right. That'll, that'll uh, work for the moment. Uh, you need your hands <laughs> free, don't you? Yes. Oh, is that, is that me? Okay, we got Mike there on. There we go. All right, back to work. All right, so the next animal we have is another species from Asia. It commands very high respect. This is an iconic, dangerous animal that kind of has a reputation <clears throat> for being very deadly and aggressive. But we're going to see how this animal is going to act today. Oh, if you don't mind, yes. sir. All okay. right. We want you guys all to be very quiet. Please so, be quiet. We are going to start right here. We don't want to scare the snake, do we? <laughs> or whatever animal it is. Yes. <laughs> what the mystery animal. What we have here is an Asian monocled cobra. Come on. He's giving you a nice little peek right now, and we'll bring him out in a second. Actually, let me switch. There you go. There you go. Okay, I wanted to see a little bit of a hood, and now we're going to take him out. So this is our monocle cobra, and what you can see is, even though it's a deadly, deadly animal, it is not trying to bite me. It is one of those defensive animals that's actually a flight animal. Even though it has the power to kill me, it really would just kind of go back to bed. And that's the thing about a lot of these animals. <laughs> and that's an important thing for such a deadly animal to show that it doesn't just try and kill you. It's really a defensive animal. You can come up, Carl. 
I think we'll get him up there. And as oh, Carl oh, oh, Miller oh. Come on. <laughs> handles his animal, we have Carl Person prepared to keep it from coming off yeah. the stage and yeah. at you. Yeah, now, no with the, now with these animals, this is a very good example that when it's in its little house and I opened it and disturbed it, it got defensive, showing you the hood. Now with this one, now once it's out, it really just kind of wants to go hide somewhere. But it does have an extremely deadly neurotoxic. It causes paralysis. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right, now this is an elapid snake. They're long and slender, typically, and they have uh, short, rigid fangs in the front of their mouth. And we're going to have to move on to some other snakes here. So thank you okay. for bringing this lovely cobra. Sure. All right. Come up. Oh, not done yet. There we go. And most importantly, the lock. Most importantly, okay. the lock. Thanks. Okay, now we have another animal coming out here. And this is Jared Fox, a former student in my lab. And Jared did his PhD studying scorpions. But this is a lovely creature. And um, let me see if I can have you describe that. You go ahead, Bill. Okay, so this is a rhinoceros viper from Africa, and this is a deadly snake. They get pretty sizable, as you can tell, even bigger than this. And uh, I love the pattern on that. This is a viper. So the viper is, vipers are different than the elapids. You just saw an elapid. These have long fangs that fold against the roof of the mouth. That's how they can be much longer. And um, they're interesting. They, when they feed, they like to find a place where they can coil up and ambush a rodent or a bird or some animal that is running or hopping by, and they strike it, and they inject the venom, and then they let go, okay? Why would they let go? That animal runs off and dies some distance. They don't want to be injured. A lot of rodents, other mammals can, can bite them and injure them. So they let go, the animal dies, and now the most amazing thing happens. The snake starts flicking its tongue, and it actually follows the chemical trail, the odors left on the ground, and it can find its meal. Pretty extraordinary, isn't that? Okay, so lovely rhinoceros viper. Thank you very much, Jared. Okay, everybody in behind is backing away. <laughs> All right, we have more animals here. All right, this next little bit is going to be a little complicated, okay? So we have, uh, we're going to try to show you Southern California's six rattlesnake species. You see the rattle on this snake? Make sure the camera to the right can see it. So this one to the left is a red diamond rattlesnake, and this one over here is a Southern Pacific rattlesnake, the darker one. Um, they're both uh, very common, especially in the Loma Melinda area. You can see them in the hills right behind this campus. And uh, we've got a couple more animals coming out. Uh, we have to do this carefully. Coming through, guys. Uh, we got another one coming out here, and that's uh, Jared. Jared has a speckled rattlesnake. Now, these really like rockier habitats, and uh, they have the little cross bands on them, and uh, they're beautiful animals and tend to have a little bit smaller head. And we're going to bring out three more snakes. Um, we're going to bring this one back through, coming through. All right, how are we doing there? We got another one coming? It's a lot of work to take them out of the box, put them back in the box. But uh, these are my favorite animals. I've been studying these since, uh, since I snuck a couple of them into my house when I was a little kid. <laughs> Don't tell my mom. Um, okay, so here we have a Mojave rattlesnake, the big one. The big one's the Mojave rattlesnake, often called the green Mojave rattlesnake because they're greenish. These are in the high desert. Their venom is especially toxic because they have a, a particular neurotoxin. And our sidewinder, hey, let's, let's, let's let the sidewinder crawl on the ground maybe a little bit. Okay, so um, I'm going to, okay, so this is a sidewinder right here. This is very common in our sandy desert habitats. They don't get as big as the others, but they're very pale to match the sand. And they crawl sideways. They sidewind. It's actually a looping motion. And um, 
Jared, drop it for a minute. See if, see if it'll crawl. Can we get a camera on that? See if we can get it to crawl sideways. Would you like to see that? You gotta watch the camera here. See if we can get it to crawl sideways. There it is starting to crawl. See what? Let's crawl. They don't listen very well. By the way, snakes can't hear. They don't have ears for hearing. But you see a little bit of sideways crawling there. And uh, these, are, these are my favorite snake. We've, I've been with students out in the desert. We've gotten venom from over 100 of these guys. Okay, very good. And let's put that one away, coming through. And this is a western diamondback rattlesnake. Sidewinder is the smallest. This is the largest, although it doesn't get as big in California. You've got to go to Texas, of course. Texas, where they're huge. But these can get up eight feet or so, okay? And um, they tend to be very defensive. This is our little pussycat. This one's pretty tame for a Western Diamondback rattlesnake. Um, we're very careful with it even so, but uh, isn't that a beautiful animal? And I want to emphasize that these animals are not out to get us. They want nothing to do with us. They just want to be left alone. And kids, what do you do when you see a rattlesnake? Two steps back, Jack. All right, thank you very much. We got one more? Okay, okay, come on out, Zach. All right, I want to talk with Zach here. Zach is a doctoral student in my lab, and I'm going to give you the mic. And uh, Zach has been doing something very interesting with the venom of snakes. You want to briefly tell us about that? Yeah, so as Bill said, uh, I'm a doctoral student in the lab of Dr. John Zhang, and we've been looking at how we can use uh, venom from different rattlesnake species and also different elapid species to treat bleeding as well as brain swelling after neurosurgery or brain surgery. Okay, so uh, why, why is bleeding and swelling a problem in the brain? So if you think about where the brain is at, right, it's in this hard, rigid skull, so there's not a lot of room for expansion. So after surgery, um, often patients will experience some swelling and some small bleeding, and so we want to uh, alleviate that or mitigate that so that they'll have um, better long-term outcomes. I love it. Let's show some PowerPoint slides. I love it, Zach. Um, so, yeah, so and another thing, so it's really cool about being here at Loma Linda is that in Bill's lab, we get to understand how the animal behaves, uh, kind of the ecology of it, and then we also get to study the venom. And then once we do that, we can apply it, right? So then we can treat patients. That's the amazing thing, if I can have PowerPoint slides. So what's fascinating about venom is designed to kill, but we humans can tap that to save human lives, okay? I'm looking for slides. Any chance we can show those? Okay, so here we go. All right, so I want to share with you, there are actually some venoms that are used that you may have heard of. Maybe some of you have been treated by this. So we're gonna go through these real quickly. We have Prealt from the cone snail. It's used to treat severe chronic pain. We got Bietta from a, a lizard that occurs even in California for treating diabetes. We've got Capitan from a viper for high blood, treating high blood pressure and heart attacks. We have Agristat from saw scaled vipers treating prolonged chest pain. Any of you recognize any of these medications? Maybe, yeah, I see hands going up, okay. They're from venoms of all things. Tumor paint, isn't that amazing? What does tumor paint do? Yeah, so tumor paint is the one that uh, people are really interested in because the protein from the scorpion venom actually binds to tumor cells. So, and uh, once it binds, you can shine a light over it and it fluoresces. So then when your surgeon goes in to remove some of those cancer cells, they don't leave any behind. So it's actually really interesting and very promising. Excellent, and I want to emphasize that Zach's work is in Dr. John Zhang's lab, and it's fabulous work. I love what he's doing, trying to use snake venom, rattlesnake venom, to give you a better surgical outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right. I, I, you've, you've gotten acquainted with some of my students. I just want to say that we are creating... There's, a, there's another animal. Hold tight. A big animal. We're trying to create a friends group. Uh, my students and I love uh, interacting with people. We love showing our animals. If you have some interest in becoming part of our friends, you see my email address. I have a new website that's not quite ready to start, but maybe tomorrow. But uh, we can put you on the mailing list. You could come to special visits to the lab. We might take you out scorpion hunting, snake hunting. Maybe you'd like to go to a rattlesnake den. Um, maybe even international trips, special events annual reports that you can read. 
Uh, we'd love to hear from you, so do email me. Take a photo of that, maybe, if you want to uh, have my email address. If you look up rattlesnakes at Loma Linda University, you're probably going to find me. We'd love to have your, uh, uh, a part of what we do. Mm -hmm. All right, Carl's back for one more animal, and um, stick around for this. You want to see this one. All right. <laughs> all right, everyone, and thank you for all the wonderful reception. We've all had a good time tonight. We've saved someone very special for you. Um, we've saved an animal that's kind of large, so we need some backup help here. <laughs> this is Alice, our albino reticulated python. <laughs> we may have to stretch this one yes. out just to see how <laughs> long it is. Now, wow, look at that. As we said, the anaconda is the largest overall snake in the world. But the reticulated python is the longest species of snake in the world. This snake can go well over 25 feet and about 175 to 250 pounds. It is an extreme predator. It is the top predator wherever it lives. It can take down prey that's well over 100 pounds. They are true constrictors. They will grab their prey wrap on it, constrict until it is no longer with us, and then slowly swallow down its prey. These snakes, like all boas and pythons, actually even have an extra row of teeth. They've got our regular top and bottom, and then they have two rows of teeth in the very top, which actually are connected to ligaments, which pull the prey into their mouth like a little conveyor belt. These are found all over Asia, Indonesia, are any of them in Florida at this point? Yes, unfortunately. Yeah, there are some. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of those, another, another animal you get as a baby, and they're really cute, and then within about five years, they're 17 feet. Does this make a, a, a good pet? This makes a terrible pet, Don't unless you're very experienced. All right, very good. Now, did you have a, this is an albino, do you have a regular one that you brought with you? Um, we do not. We Didn't just have our normals, tonight. yes. Okay, so normally this is much browner and blacker and, yes. and, and, and beautiful. Not that this one isn't. This yeah. is a gorgeous animal. Yeah. All right, what do you guys think of that one? Yes. Yeah. And, right. and Alice is so sweet, she'll be available for photos out on the grass. You mean they can touch her? You can pet, interact, wow. and uh, really get a true feel of this animal. The wow. muscular, the scales, and really see what they're all about up close. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Now, before you go, please hang tight. Please hang tight. If I could have one more slide. Pastor Sean is back here, and uh, we, we want to thank a few people for all the effort they put into this program. I hope you enjoyed the program. I thought it was a lot of fun to put together, and it was beautiful, wasn't it? It sure was. And boys and girls, tonight we want to um, thank Dr. Bill Hayes and for sharing his knowledge. These programs couldn't happen without him, so we really appreciate that. We also thank Carl Miller for bringing all his animals. And we have several people who sponsor. We have Loma Linda University Health. We have Loma Linda University Student Services, as well as the Southeastern California Conference. So we want to thank them. Thank you. Thank you. Those three, those four entities, they're, they're so good. Well, Bill, let's go ahead and pray so that we can go out and enjoy the animals. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, wow, we are amazed at the creatures that you have made. And we're so excited to be able to touch them and to learn more about them. We just thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go outside the back doors and have some fun. Thank you for coming tonight.